don't have a Sunday school class, I want to encourage you to be involved in Sunday school. We had one of our best classes today in Sunday school. A lot of talk and uh, uh, sharing that went on. Of course, uh, I guess uh, Mike tugged at some strings of interest of, of the class, and he told about some preparation for war stories and stuff like that, and that interests and intrigues me, and he shared about that and uh, some of the visits that he's had with some of the former presidents of the United States, and, and Jimmy just brought a great lesson in how we, we as Christians, as believers, should be on a search and rescue mission to save people from hell, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, the Savior for this world, because there's nothing else. The, you turn to the world, it's not going to save you, but there's only one person one being that can save us. And we as Christians should be prepared, just as Mike described how, how the military would gather information, would gather supplies to go out and save people, to return them, to bring them back to safety. We should do the same thing for, for uh, the lost world as well. So it was a great, great lesson. So I encourage you to, to come visit us, come visit one of the classes, and take a part of that. So we'll be reading in John chapter 5 uh, again this morning. King Richard the First, you know him as King Richard the First, the Lionheart. Chad, go ahead and show those pictures if you wouldn't mind, just uh, flip through those two. But he was held captive here in Dernsing Castle, uh, and it was around the, the late 12th century, I believe it was, but he was held captive there for for, for ransom and the ransom that was to be paid for him. Now, it's in ruins right now. It's in Austria. But uh, there's a city that's just below it now that is, that is thriving in there. But this castle is still there, the, what's left of it. But he was held for a ransom of 65,000 pounds of silver. Uh, the people had to pay a ransom to get their king back. He was captured because he, he uh, degraded, disgraced the Austrian flag and Duke Leopold. He, he ripped it down. He was part of these crusades, these Christian crusades that went all throughout Europe and Asia uh, trying to, to do battle against Muslims and, and, and uh, trying to spread Christianity. But they conquered the crusade that he was on, conquered this one castle or this one town and they flew these flags and he would not allow for his king's flag his flag to be flown next to that of a duke so he ripped that flag down and he trampled it well he pretty much made everybody for the most part in the world mad at him for one reason or another so so he's captured by this duke in austria and held at this dernstein castle here for sixty-five thousand pounds of silver ransom he was held for this ransom. But we have a king who did not have to be ransomed. We have a king who came to ransom us. And we see this in John chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 17. Jesus has just described, we talked about this last week. He's just talked about the healing at the pool of Bethesda. About the lame man who's been there by this pool for for 38 years, we talked about the significance of the 38 years and how Jesus approaches the man and says, do you really want to be well? Because you would think that after 38 years of lying there, he could have made it to that pool. The question was for us as well. Do you really want to be well? Do you really want to change in your life? Do you really want to do something different? Do you want to experience something better? Well, you've been in your condition for 38 years. Surely you can do something. So Jesus tells the lame man, what did he say? He said, get up, pick up, and do something different. That is the message for us. You want to experience something different in your life? You're going to have to quit doing what you're doing. Jesus says, you, he says, I have rescued you from that. I've saved you from that. I've come. I've provided a way out for you. Do you really want it? Do you really want to be well? Or are you so comfortable in your pit, in, in your sorrow, in your pain, that you're just going to stay there? 
So many people live their life like that. They are comfortable in the pit. They are comfortable in the mire, in the muck. They are comfortable in the, in the day-to-day agony that they just stay there. They are more afraid of what the freedom might actually be like, so they just stay in the chains and in the bondage. They never come to the realization that there's freedom in Christ. So Jesus tells the man, get up. He says, pick up your mat, get up, and do something different. But there's a problem with that. And we saw that around verse 10, I believe it was. There was a problem there, and the Jewish leaders didn't like that. Why didn't the Jewish leaders like that? Because it's the Sabbath. Jesus is becoming popular. Jesus is causing a, beginning to cause this uprising, and they have issue with that. Jesus, we've got this under control. We've got the people suppressed. They have to come for us. We have this, this racket. We have, this, uh, we have the, the market cornered here at the temple. People have to come to us for, for their sacrifice. They have to come to us for, to have their money exchanged to get into the temple. They have to come to us for everything, and we have the market cornered, and we're making money hand over fist, and life's good for us political leaders. So, Jesus, don't you be coming in here and messing this up. You're healing people on the Sabbath, and that's work. And we talked about that. We talked about how ridiculous it was for these Jewish leaders to come and to accuse him of that. And, and they really end up wanting to kill him over, over this and who he claims to be. Let's look at verse 17 and 18. So he answers them because they have a reason for him. He's being persecuted. He's going to be persecuted. They have, a, they have issue with him healing on the Sabbath. So verse 17, but he answered them. My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Verse 18, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he, he not only was breaking the Sabbath, he's not only working on the Sabbath, he's not only putting out effort, he's not only doing something on the Sabbath. Now, what's he gone and done? He's called himself God's son. He's heir. He's, he's in line. He's making himself equal to God. So they got a problem with it. They don't like that. Here the king of kings comes to rescue them. The king of kings came to rescue these Jewish leaders. He comes to rescue us. We don't have to ransom him. He saves us. He offered it to them. It's available to us as well. Yet they, we, even in today's time, we will not submit to the Messiah. These Jewish leaders wouldn't have anything to do with him. Didn't want to submit to him. He's going to prove that he's God's son. He's going to prove that he is the Messiah. He's going to prove he's the one they've been waiting for. But they will not give in. They will not accept him. And we do the same thing. We think, I can manage it on my own. I can manage my life on my own. I'll do it on my own. I don't need anybody else's help. And I sure don't need Jesus. That's the world we live in. Verse 19. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Man won't submit. Man won't give in. Man will not commit to Christ. And Jesus is going to give a clear warning, and we're going to see that. The first thing that we see is there's an ultimate rejection. The Jews are going to reject Christ. They're they're in the middle of it right now, beginning to reject him, beginning to persecute him. You're not the one we want. You're not the Messiah that we're looking for. So there's going to be this ultimate rejection. We reject him in our life. I don't need your help. I'm fine on my own. Let me ask you, just how fine are you? On your own. Is it going that good for you? You got things that nice and tidy, that wrapped up on your own? It's swell, isn't it? You're doing just fine. So there's this ultimate rejection. Did Jesus know who he was? People want to say that Jesus 
Jesus never claimed to be God's son. Yes, he did. He claimed it. He proves it. He shows that. He makes those statements. And they're eventually going to kill him for making those statements. Still in verse 19. So, so Jesus answered them saying, Truly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless he sees his father doing it. Verse 20. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. He says, Jesus says, what you see me doing, I've seen the father do. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you think Jesus and the father, maybe they're on two different levels. Maybe, maybe you think God's this, this angry old guy in heaven and Jesus is more compassionate but this kind of struck me when, when I was reading this this week does Jesus love you absolutely without a doubt I believe Jesus came he died for me he died for you he loves you so much so that he gave his life for you but Jesus says I only do what I see the father doing now, I, I, sometimes I picture God as more, maybe you do, you picture God as more of this stern person. Fear the Lord, be afraid of him, tremble at his name. You can never please the Lord. He's the God of this Old Testament that you could never live up to, so therefore you're doomed, you'll never, you'll never make it, you can never do anything to please God. But yet Jesus seems to be this compassionate person that gives his life for the people. But here in this verse, it says Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing. He sees the Father's love for you. I thought, that's great. That is great. There is more love in the heaven than I can put my finger on. There is more love in heaven for me than I can begin to grasp with my little mind. So Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. So the Father is not unloving. The Father is not unforgiving. The Father is not uncompassionate. Jesus does what he sees the Father doing. Verse 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Now the Jews believe, now here's where they have a problem. The Jews believe that only God could raise from the dead. Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and they're going to have issue with that. They believed only God could do that. Verse 22, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So Jesus is still speaking here. He says the Father, he says the Father can raise from the dead, I can raise from the dead. You're about to see that, you're going to witness that. The Jews believed only God could do that. They believed, the Jews believed only God could judge somebody. But Jesus says, God has given that to me. The Father has given that authority to me. He says, I am God. You guys need to get this. I am the Messiah. Yet you want to reject me. You have this ultimate rejection in your mind, in your heart, in your actions. You will not accept me for who I am. Jesus Christ is God. Verse 23. So that all, all honor, all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus wants them to know, if you reject the Son, if you reject the Messiah, if you reject me, Jesus is talking to them, if you reject me, you have, in essence, therefore, rejected the Father. He even takes this a little further. He's going to give them some proof. He's going to prove to them who he is. Verse 31. Jesus says, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. If there's just one person, if it's just Jesus stating it, what can they do? They can discredit that. If it's just one person in a court that gives a testimony, they say that won't stand up. The, the witness, the testimony of one person would not stand up in court. They had to have two or three. Well, Jesus is about to give them four examples 
He's about to give them, prove to them, show them four witnesses that testify to who Jesus is. Here's how he's here, the first one he's going to produce. Verse 33 is John the Baptist. He says, you have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. What did John do? John the Baptist testified to who Jesus was. How did he testify? He baptized him. John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus, or before he comes, he sees Jesus walking. What does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We've already gone through this. We've already talked about this. The Jews knew immediately who John was talking about. They knew immediately what, they, what he was referring to when he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Not only that, but after he baptized him, what happened? A dove descends on him. God speaks, says, this is my son. Now that's the second thing. The second one is verse 36. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. So Jesus says, there's another one. Here's the second witness. Here's the second testimony to who I am. The second, second witness for you, and it's greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, that the Father has sent me. So here in verse 36, John, John is writing Jesus' words that, that the works alone testify to who I am. The third witness was God. When the, when the dove did ascend on Jesus and God said, this is my son who I am well pleased with. Now here's the fourth one. Verse 38 and 39, you do not have his word abiding in you for you do not believe him who sent me. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. He says the word alone, the scripture alone testifies about me, but you will not receive it. The word has spoken. The prophets have spoken. They have prophesied about the one coming. Here I am fulfilling these things, but yet you still reject. He says you claim to be experts at this law. You claim to be experts at the word, at, at, the, at what you have, but yet you will not receive when the one stands in front of you. Back to verse 22. He says, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus says, I am God's Son. I am God, but yet I've given you, I've given you witness after witness testimony after testimony and you still reject what's it going to take what was it going to take for these jews what's it going to take for you to realize that jesus christ is what you need in your life probably every one of you here are professing to be saved if, if you are that's great then you need to bring somebody with you. Because Sunday after Sunday, I'm given an invitation. The word is presented. If we truly want to see people brought to the Lord, if we truly want to see people saved, then we need to be bringing them in. You need to be sharing with them out there, bring them in here, give them, bringing them to a point to accept Christ as who he is. To accept Christ as God's son, the one that died for you and for them on the cross to forgive them of their sin. Jesus says, what's it going to take for you guys to believe? Because there's going to be something else that comes in and you're going to follow after it. But you will not believe when one stands in front of you and gives you sign after sign. You have this ultimate rejection. And to reject Christ is the ultimate rejection. Now here's the second thing. There's this grand illusion. Verse 39. He says, you guys claim to be these experts. You search the scriptures. That search means to investigate. You, you dive in. You dig into it. You go at it bit by bit. You are searching, you are seeking out the scriptures 
for the one that it's talking about. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. You feel they were convinced that if they studied the scripture hard enough, that if they lived by the law close enough and followed it word for word, then that would give them salvation. But he says you think if you search them long enough and hard enough and deep enough that you will have eternal life. But it's these scriptures that testify about me. Now, what did Moses say about the law? Moses said that you had to keep every law. Solomon said that there's not even a righteous man that can keep the law. Paul said that we've broken the law. Everybody has broken the law. James says you break one and you break all of them. So where do you stand in that? Moses says you had to keep them all. Solomon said there's not even a righteous person that can do that. James says you break one, you've broken them all. Yet these Jews in this time thought if we can keep the law, if we can abide by just the law, we will experience salvation. They thought by keeping their rituals that they would be saved. You know how crazy their rituals are? To this day, they try to keep those rituals. There's one that I was reading about. They have to take a special elevator. It's called the Shabbat elevator. They have a Gentile elevator, and then they have a Jewish elevator that's used on Sundays. On Sundays, they can't work. And to ride an elevator is what? To ride an elevator is work. Uh, uh, there, to ride an elevator, there has to be a spark. There has to be a connection. Two points has to connect, start a, make a spark to, to power the elevator. That's work. Now, you Gentiles, you can hop on an elevator. You can go from floor one to floor ten, not a problem. But the Jews, they have to stop at every floor so as not to work too hard, not to cause something to work. And that's the truth, the honest truth. This is the law that they live under. Can you imagine that? That's just one. They have hundreds of laws that they're supposed to keep. You can't keep that. Jesus comes to free you from that. But we may not live under that law. We live under laws of churches, laws of, of what we think is expected for us, laws of, uh, of our life. We live under laws of, of bondage and, and, and struggles. But yet Christ offers freedom through his grace. But yet we will not surrender and live under what he provides. Jesus says, I give life. Jesus says, there's life in me, but you search these laws, these rituals, as if they're going to bring something to you. Jesus says, I have life for you. Have you experienced his life yet? Are you still seeking, searching? Can you even hear him? Can you even hear him at 11.10 right now? Or are you so distracted by something that happened this week, last night, right now, that you cannot even hear his voice? What are you trying to live under? What is it that has you boxed in, captivated, suppressed that you cannot hear his voice in your life the Holy Spirit convict you have you lost that have you drifted so far away that you can't even feel the conviction of the Spirit anymore in your life in a, in a medical journal there was a story about some there was an opera uh, some opera singers they were the conductor was leading them, and he was. they were coming across this one piece in the, in the music that they were struggling with, that they were missing the note every time in, in this piece. And the conductor would want, what's going on here? What's the problem? Why are they missing this? Why are they off key here? Just this one or two people. So he brings in these doctors. They practice it time and time again. They continue to miss it and miss it. He brings in these doctors, these specialists, these uh, 
people that work with your throat and everything. And what is going on here? Can they, why are they missing that? Test their voice. Can they not reach it? Can they not hit that note? Or is it out of their scale, out of their range? So they test these, these opera singers. They, and then one doctor says, well, let's, let's listen to their hearing. Let's test their hearing. So they reproduce the sound that they were to make to hit the note that they were to hit. And they could not even hear the note. So these opera singers, it's not that they couldn't do it. It's not that they couldn't sing it. It's not that their voice wasn't able or capable of reaching that note or doing it. It's that they couldn't hear it. It's not that you can't do it. It's not that you can't overcome it. Your ear isn't even tuned in to Christ right now. Your ear isn't even tuned in to the Holy Spirit. You can do it. Through Christ. Here's the third thing. We live our life, we think we're so righteous, I'm fine, everything's good with me, my salvation is secure, my righteousness will get me to heaven. We live in our own ability and we don't even hear Christ. The third thing is this deadly deception. Verse 41. Christ says, I do not receive glory from men. Now why? Why doesn't he receive glory from men? He receive glory from you? Lip service from you? He says, I don't even receive glory from men. Verse 44. He's going to answer it. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. You've rejected me because you're too busy glorifying each other. You need to read that. You go home and read it again. Why can't we hear? Because we're not even tuned in to him. We can't give him glory because we're too busy. We can't hear his voice because we're too busy listening. Our ear is tuned in to the world. And the world tells us, well, if you just go shopping with me, you just buy that, you know, that... Uh, coach bag, that Vera Bradley purse, you just buy those Bob shoes or, or whatever. You just buy the LeBron James $150 coot, whatever they are. I don't know. You just buy those shoes and you'll, you'll be in, in right with the world. I got nothing against that stuff. It's fine if you got it. But if that's, if that's your idol, if it's become an idol to you, then that's wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if the, if the Walmart brand has become an idol to you. That's wrong. Jesus says, I don't get glory because you're too busy listening to the world. You're too busy going to your co-worker or your, your, your relatives or something that are, that are living away from me. You're getting your advice from them. You're, you're living under, under what Hollywood says or what, what the news media says or, or, or what somebody else says. And you've accepted that lie from Satan. And it's a deadly deception that leads you to pain. Satan has the market on a lie. And we have bought it. You're all fishermen. Most of you. You feed hundreds of people out here once a year with your crappie and your catfish. And you got that bait out there and you hook that fish every time and you pull it in. And that's what Satan has done to us. This looks appealing. Your rabbit feather, turkey feather, whatever it is, jig that you got. Looks good to the fish. They gobble it up. Satan's got his own rabbit hairs and turkey feathers and what not for each one of us and we go shopping at his store willingly every day but we don't give God glory because we're too busy listening to the world what it has to say verse 43 I've come in my father's name and you do not receive me 
if another comes in his own name, Jesus says, guys, look, I've come in the, the Yahweh's name. I've come in Jehovah's name. I, I've come as the Messiah to save you, but there's somebody else coming. He's going to come in his own name, and what are you going to do? You will receive him. He says, many more are coming. He says, there's false ones that are coming, and yet you're going to receive him. Josephus, the, the historian, said that after 70 A.D., false messiahs erupted, just exploded on the, machine, on the scene. And they were received. He says, there are false ones coming who you will receive. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. Just let me read this to you. For false Christ and false prophets will arise. And will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead. What has hooked you? What has misled you? What is it? You can identify it, put your finger on it, point to it, sacrifice, say, this is what it is in my life. I want it gone, God. Identify it for me, illuminate it, show me, give me a way out. He says, false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead. If possible, even the elect. Now, who are the elect? You're the elect. You are the elect. You are chosen to receive a new body. You are, are chosen to be placed in Christ as, as accepting him for salvation. Now, there are a lot of people on church on church rolls who are deceived, and you see that every Sunday in every church because they're not here. They've been deceived by this deadly deception. So, so Christ says, look, he says, there's some false, there are false teachers, there are false prophets, there are false Christ who are coming, and you will receive them. Now let me ask you, what are you eating? Are you eating prepared meals that somebody else has made for you? Are you eating prepared messages? Is this the only time that you get fed? You come on Sunday to Sunday school and Sunday morning to the service, and that's it. If this is the only time you get fed and you're not getting your own food, how easily are these people going to be able to be deceived? You have a responsibility in it. This should not be, if you only ate once or twice a week, your physical body would starve to death. What about your spiritual body? Your spiritual body is hungry. Are you starving it to death? Now, I believe, I believe in the priesthood of believers. Where the Holy Spirit indwells in each believer and equips them. To, to lead the church, to guide the church, but, but many a church has been misled and has been deceived by men thinking, I now know, and therefore I can, I can guide, I can teach the church, I can direct the church the way it should go. That's a deadly deception when we do it on our own. It's amazing how today we're misled into believing that if it, if it feels right, if it feels good for me, even if it's contrary to the word of God, then it must be okay. But we do that. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's indulging in something, shopping, whatever it is. Spending time away from our family disengaged with the body? Christ says, that's contrary to my word. My word says for you to, to not forsake the gathering together with one another. My word says for you to fellowship. Matter of fact, they even fellowshiped every day together. They were together every day. So we have these these idols in our life, these stumbling blocks in our life, and, and they can become, they, they do become, they are these struggles to us. But Christ says, hey, hey, there's one coming. You think you've, there's some deception out there now? He says, there's one coming. There's a deceiver coming, the likes that this world has never seen, and it's the Antichrist. 
you think it's bad now, there is one coming who will trick the whole world. And you need to realize that whatever you give Satan is never enough. You give Satan a little time, he's going to ask for more. You give Satan a, a little money, he's going to want more. You give Satan a little attention, he's going to demand more. Satan is never satisfied until he gets it all. What starts out as small, snowball effect, gets bigger and bigger. In sports, you put your rally cap on, you hope for the snowball effect. We're all hitting, or one person hits a three, another guy hits a three, the whole team is hitting threes. Everybody's getting a base hit. You want to roll with it? That's what happens in our life, too, when we don't listen to the Word, to God. When we drift from that, we are deceived into thinking I'm righteous enough on my own and I'll be okay. And Satan is never satisfied until he gets it all. Now, I told you a few weeks ago, it's not your salvation. If you are saved, if you've truly accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, as God's Son, you're forgiven. You're saved. Your eternity is secure. You are placed in His hand. But what Satan can do, he can't steal your salvation, but what he can do is he can wreck your life Wreck your witness. Wreck your testimony to somebody else. And that's what he'll do. He can't have your salvation or your eternity, but he can wreck the remainder of your life. So do you know Christ as Lord? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you received him? Have you confessed of your sins? Because to do Anything less than that is the ultimate rejection. The Jews rejected him. But I pray that no one here has rejected him the way they did. But if you have, this is the time. It's your opportunity to confess your sin. You don't have to do it to me. You just do it to him. He knows them anyway. Admit to them. Admit that you're a sinner. We've all fallen short. We've broken one. We've broken them all. There is no one righteous. But Christ made a way through his sacrifice. The way for salvation. The way to break bondage. A way to crush idols. I need him every day. And I suspect you do too. Lord, if there is one here today.